Admiral Richard Byrd was a highly regarded explorer, and in 1947 he headed the Operation High Jump down to Antarctica. And after he passed, his son found his diary and published it. And here is an excerpt from the diary itself. Flight Log, Base Camp, Arctic, February 19th, 1947. 0600 hours. All preparations are complete for flight north, and we are airborne with full fuel tanks at 0610 hours. 0620 hours. Fuel mixture on starboard engine seems too rich. Adjustment weighed, and Pratt and Whitney's running smoothly. 0730 hours. Radio check with base camp. All is well, and radio reception is normal. 0740 hours. Note slight oil leak on starboard engine. Oil pressure indicator seems normal, however. 0800 hours. Slight turbulence noted from easterly direction at altitude of 2321 feet. Correction to 1700 feet. No further turbulence, but tailwind increases. Slight adjustment in throttle controls. Aircraft performing very well now. 0815 hours. Radio check with base camp. Situation normal. 0830 hours. Turbulence encountered again. Increased altitude to 2,900 feet. Smooth flight conditions again. 0910 hours. Vast ice and snow below. Note coloration of yellowish nature. And disperse in a linear pattern. Altering course for a better examination of this color pattern below. Note reddish or purple color also. Circle this area two full turns and return to assigned compass heading. Position check made again to base camp and relay information concerning coloration of the ice and snow below. 0910 hours. Both magnetic and gyro compasses beginning to gyrate and wobble. We are unable to hold our heading by instrumentation. Take bearing with the sun compass, yet all seems well. The controls are seemingly slow to respond and have sluggish quality but there is no indication of icing. 0915 hours. In the distance is what appears to be mountains. 0949 hours. 29 minutes elapsed flight time from the first sighting of the mountains. It is no illusion. There are mountains and consisting of a small range that I've never seen before. 0955 hours. Altitude changed to 2950 feet encountering strong turbulence again. We are crossing over a small mountain range and still proceeding northward as best as can be ascertained. Beyond the mountain range is what appears to be a valley with a small river or stream running through the center portion. There should be no green valley below. Something is definitely wrong and abnormal here. We should be over ice and snow. To the port side, are great forests growing on mountain slopes. Our navigation instruments are still spinning. 10.05. I alter altitude to 1400 feet and execute a sharp left turn to better examine the valley below. It is green, with either moss or type of tight-knit grass. The light here seems different. I cannot see the sun anymore. We make another left turn and we spot what seems to be large animal of some kind below. It appears to be an elephant. No, it looks more like a mammoth. This is incredible, yet there it is. Decrease altitude to 1,000 feet and take binoculars to better examine the animal. It is confirmed. It is definitely a mammoth-like animal. Report this to base camp. 10.30 hours. Encountering more rolling green hills now. The external temperature indicator reads 74 degrees Fahrenheit. Continuing on our heading now. Navigation instruments seem normal now. I am puzzled over the actions. Attempt to contact base camp. Radio is not functioning. 11.30 hours. Countryside below is more level and normal. If I may use that word. Ahead we spot what seems to be a city. This is impossible. Aircraft seems light and oddly buoyant. The controls refuse to respond. My God. Off our port and starboard wings are strange type of aircraft. They are closing rapidly alongside. They are disc shaped and have a radiant quality to them. They are close enough now to see the markings on them. It is a type of swastika. This is fantastic. 
Where are we? What is happening? I tug at the controls again. They will not respond. We are caught in an invisible vice grip of some type. A radio crackles and voice comes through in English for what it perhaps is a slight Nordic or Germanic accent. The message is, Welcome, Admiral, to our domain. We shall land you in exactly seven minutes. Relax, Admiral. You're in good hands. I note the engines of our plane have stopped running. The aircraft is under some strange control and is now turning itself. The controls are useless. 11.40 hours. Another radio message received. We begin the landing process now, and in moments the plane shudders slightly and begins to descend, as though caught in some great unseen elevator. The downward motion is negligible, and we touch down with only a slight jolt. 11.45 hours. I'm making a hasty last entry in the flight log. Several men are approaching on foot toward our aircraft. They are tall with blonde hair. In the distance is a large, shimmering city, pulsating with rainbow hues of color. I do not know what is going to happen now, but I see no signs of weapons, and those approaching, I hear now a voice ordering me by name to open the cargo door. I comply. And log. From this point on, I write all the following events here for memory. It defies the imagination and would seem all but madness if it had not happened. The radio man and I are taken from the aircraft and we are received in a most cordial manner. We then board it on small platform like conveyance with no wheels. It moves, moves us towards the glowing of the city with great swiftness. As we approach, the city seems to be made of crystal material. Soon we arrive at a large building that is a type I have never seen before. It appears to be right out of the design board of Frank Lloyd Wright, or perhaps more correctly, out of a Buck Rogers setting. We are given some type of warm beverage which tasted like nothing I've ever savored before. It is delicious. After about 10 minutes, Two of our wondrous appearing hosts come to our quarters and announce that I am to accompany them. I have no choice but to comply. I leave my radio man behind and we walk a short distance and enter what seems to be an elevator. We descend downward for some moments. The machine stops and the door lifts silently upward. We, we proceed down a long hallway that is lit by rose-colored light and seems to be emanating from the walls themselves. One of the beings motions to us to stop before a great door. Over the door is an inscription that I cannot read. The great door slides noiselessly open, and I am beckoned to enter. One of my hosts speaks. Have no fear, Admiral. You are to have an audience with the Master. I bid you welcome to our domain, Admiral. I see a man with delicate features and with the etching of years upon his face. He is seated at a long table. He motions me to sit down in one of the chairs. After I am seated, he places his fingertips together and smiles. He speaks softly again and conveys the following. We have let you enter here because you are of noble character and well known on the surface world, Admiral. Surface world? I half gasp under my breath. Yes, the master replies with a smile. You are in domain of the Ariani, the inner world of the earth. We shall not long delay your mission, and you will be safely escorted back to the surface and for a distance beyond. But now, Admiral, I shall tell you why you have been summoned here. Our interest rightly begins just after your race exploded the first atomic bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan. It was at that alarming time we sent our flying machines the flugel rods to your surface world to investigate what your race had done. That is, of course, past history now, my dear Admiral, but I must continue on. You see, we have never interfered before in your race's wars and barbarity, but now we must, for you have learned to tamper with a certain power that is not for man, namely that of atomic energy. Our emissaries have already delivered messages to the powers of your world, and yet they do not heed. Now you have been chosen to be witness here. 
that our world does exist. You see, our culture and science is many thousands of years beyond your race, Admiral. I interrupted. But what does this have to do with me, sir? The master's eyes seemed to penetrate deeply into my mind, and after studying me for a few moments, he replied, Your race has now reached the point of no return, for there are those among you who would destroy your very world rather than the relinquish the power as they know it. I nodded, and the master continued. In 1945 and afterward, we tried to contact your race, but our efforts were met with hostility. Our flugel rods were fired upon. Yes, even pursued with malice and animosity by your fighter planes. So now, I say to you, my son, there is a great storm gathering in your world, a black fury that will not spend itself for many years. There will be no answers in your armies. There will be no safety in your science. It may rage on until every flower of your culture is trampled and all human things are leveled in vast chaos. Your recent war was only a prelude to what yet to come for your race. We here see it more clearly with each hour. Do you say I am mistaken? Then he gestured with a lovely, slender hand, a motion of peace, and our meeting was truly ended. Quickly, we walked back through the great door of the master's chamber and once again entered into the elevator. The door slid silently downward, and we were once going upward. One of my hosts spoke again. We must now make haste, Admiral, as the master desires to delay you no longer on your scheduled timetable, and you must return with this message to your race. I said nothing. All of this was almost beyond belief, and once again my thoughts were interrupted as we stopped. I entered the room and was again with my radio man. He had an ancient, anxious expression on his face. As I approached, I said, It's all right, Howie. It's all right. The two beings motioned us toward the awaiting conveyance. We boarded and soon arrived back at the aircraft. The engines were idling and we were boarded immediately. The whole atmosphere seemed charged now with a certain air of urgency. After the cargo door was closed, the aircraft was immediately lifted by the unseen force until we reached an altitude of 2,700 feet. Two of the aircraft were alongside for some distance, guiding us on our return. I must state here, the airspeed indicator registered no reading, yet we were moving along at a very rapid rate. Two fifteen hours, a radio message comes through. We are leaving you now, Admiral. Your controls are free. We watched for a moment as the flugel rods disappeared into the pale blue sky. The aircraft suddenly felt as though caught in a sharp downdraft for a moment. We quickly recovered her control. We do not speak for some time. Each man has his thoughts. Entry and flight log continues. 220 hours. We are again over a vast area of ice and snow and approximately 20 minutes from base camp. We radio them, they respond. We report all conditions normal. Normal. Base camp expresses relief at our re-established contact. We land smoothly at base camp. I have a mission. End log entries. March 11th, 1947. I have just attended a staff meeting at the Pentagon. I have stated fully my discovery and the message from the master. All is duly recorded. The President has been advised. I am now detained for several hours. Six hours, thirty-nine minutes to be exact. I am interviewed intently by top security forces and a medical team. It was an ordeal. I am placed under strict control via the national security provisions to this United States of America. I am ordered to remain silent regard to all that I have learned on the behalf of humanity. Incredible. I am reminded that I am a military man and must obey orders. December 30th, 1956. These last few years elapsed since 1947 have not been kind. I now make my final entry in this singular diary. In closing, 
I must state that I have faithfully kept this matter secret as directed all these years. It is my it has been completely against my values of moral right. Now I seem to sense the long night coming on, and the secret will not die with me. But as all truth shall, it will triumph, and so it shall. This can be the only hope for mankind. I have seen the truth, and it has quickened my spirit, and has set me free. I have done my duty towards the monstrous military-industrial complex. Now the long night begins to approach, but there shall be no end. Just as the long night of the Arctic ends, the brilliant sunshine of truth shall come again, and those who are of darkness shall fall in the light. For I have seen the land beyond the pole, that center of the great unknown. Admiral Richard Byrd, United States Navy, December 1956.